Happy Australian Father's Day. It is the real Father's Day for us in the Southern Hemisphere, right? As I told my colleagues in the staff chat room today, I mentioned as Australian Father's Day as a resistance to the, the, the dominant narrative. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of studies in post-colonial theology, and so I just had to bring that up to you. Um, one of the core beliefs of our faith, represented by the songs that we sing this morning, is that the one whom we follow is risen. The Lord that we follow is alive. Jesus of Nazareth is alive. And the implication of our confession then is always the working out of what it means to follow the risen Jesus. What does it mean to follow the risen Lord? What does it mean for the life of the church in the city as we follow him? In particular, what does it all mean for being his church in the city at this particular UOB building in this particularly challenging time? What does it mean to sing the song that we just sang earlier? What does it mean to say, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. When you move, I will move. I will follow you. What does it mean to say, who you love, I will love. How you serve, I will serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. What does it mean to follow the risen Jesus, the ascended Jesus? What does it mean to be a church, a community following the risen and ascended Jesus? I want to invite you this morning to give your attention to the very last part of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. And as I say last week, this is one of the texts that actually avoided hearing and preaching. In this text, which many of us are perhaps too familiar with, we see the risen Lord makes a great claim, and then he gives a great commission, and he promises us a great comfort. And so let me invite you to stand as we read the last five verses of the Gospel of Matthew together. Let's stand together and read Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20 together with enthusiasm. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Matthew, the tax collector, that you have transformed him in such a way that Levi becomes this person who remembers his encounter with his Lord his teacher, and his friend. And by your Holy Spirit, he's able to write his encounter for us and his encounter with the risen Lord. Father, will you, by your Holy Spirit, let Matthew's encounter with Jesus also be real to us in a tangible way like never before so that we, too, will encounter him. And as we encounter him, we will be changed. For his praise and glory alone, amen. Please take your seats again. What does it mean to follow the resurrected Jesus? What does it mean to be the church? What does it mean to be doing and being church in this city? I suggest to you there are three things. The first thing is it means coming to terms with his great claim. It means finding ways to obey his great commission. And it means learning to trust in his great comfort. Three things. But let me first give you the context. At the tomb on Easter morning, the angel said to the women, He is risen. And then he is going before you into Galilee, and you will see him there. And so the women went to Galilee, to a mountain that Jesus had designated. And there Jesus meets with them on a mountain. On a mountain. If you're familiar with the larger biblical story, you know that there are many turning points that takes place on mountains. And if you're familiar with the larger Jesus story, you'll also know that a lot of significant events in his life take place on mountains. For instance, he preaches his greatest sermon describing the new humanity that he's bringing into being from a mountain, the Sermon on the Mount. And then he's transfigured on a mountain. He, uh, Elijah and Moses meets him there. His face glows like never before. It's there that a voice comes down from heaven and says, this is my son, 
listen to him. And then it's from a mountain across the valley from Jerusalem that Jesus sees the city and weeps over it because the city, the city of peace, do not know what would bring it peace. It is from a mountain, the Mount of Olives, across the temple that Jesus speaks about his return. And the first time we hear Jesus on a mountain is during his 40 days when he was tempted. When he was tempted by this angelic creature who tried to take, who's, who's, who keeps on trying actually, to take place to get God's place in the world. He says, I will give you all the nations, all the kingdoms of the world, Satan says to Jesus. Look, from this mountain, Jesus, I will give them all to you if you simply bow down and worship me. And on that particular mountain, God's enemy dared to take to himself the right only God has, the right to give the nations of the world. And then on the other mountain, after his resurrection, Jesus finally has what only God can give. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, says Matthew. But some doubted. Worship and doubt. Worship and doubt. Like many of you this morning, you will know that they often go together, right? Worship and doubt. The word doubt here does not mean disbelief or rejecting Jesus. It simply means that some in that group did not know what to make of what happened to Jesus that day. They simply did not know what to make of resurrection or what they are about to witness, the ascension. They worship him, says Matthew. As a good Jew, Matthew knows and realizes fully how startling the statement that he's making. They worship Jesus. Worship a man, a good Jew, a group of good Jewish people worship a man. And the startling thing is that on that mountain, Jesus receives their worship. He doesn't tell them to stop. In the book of Revelation, when an angel gives a vision to John, John bows down to the angel and worships the angel twice. And twice the angel said in horror, stop, do not do that. Worship God alone. But here on the mountain, they worship Jesus. And Jesus is not horrified. Jesus does not tell them to stop. Jesus receives their worship. Worship, reflecting his own self-understanding as the one who is worthy of the worship. He knows himself to be Emmanuel, God with us, resurrected and alive. And then on that mountain, Jesus speaks to his follower. He makes a great claim. He gives a great commission, and he promises a great comfort. Let's look at him by one, one by one. The great claim first. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Absolutely crazy, right? Absolutely crazy if it is not absolutely true. Absolutely insane if it is not true. All authority in heaven, all authority on earth has been given to me. <laughs> Who does this me think he is? His great claim is the inherent implication of his resurrection. To the risen one is given all authority. Again, this is absolutely crazy if it is not absolutely true. One person says, Jesus is basically saying, I am the president and CEO and sole proprietor of the universe. He is saying, I now have the last word, the very last word everywhere, the last word in heaven and the last word on earth. I have the last word in every sphere of human life. In every corner of the, of the world, I have the last word. The private, the public, the religious, the secular, the economic, the scientific, the moral, the educational, the sexual, the political, the legal, whatever it is, in entertainment, whether in sports, I have the last word. To me, it's given the last word in everything. And here, Jesus is not bragging. He's not bragging. He's just simply stating the way things are in light of his resurrection. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, not taken by me, as the devil would have wanted him to do when he was tempting Jesus. It's given to him by God, who has raised him from the dead. Now, as I see it, the church today has not even begun to come to terms with what was being said by Jesus, has not come to terms with what this means. Am I right? As followers of the risen Jesus, we have not even begun to scratch the surface and work out all the implications of this 
huge and gigantic claim. And it's understandable because this is literally a cosmic thing. The Apostle Paul, for example, writing to the church in Ephesus, he says of Jesus, God had raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also the one to come. And God had placed all things under his feet. Wow, right? Do we believe this? And then the Apostle John in the book of Revelation again. Jesus, he says, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, Paul and John are not just presenting their mere opinions that they come up with. They believe that they are actually declaring news, good news. Good news that Jesus really, really lives. Jesus really died a horrible death, yes. But Jesus really rose from the dead. Jesus is really, really alive. And to him, all authority everywhere is given. Again, Jesus is not bragging. He's just stating the fact. Like 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's a fact, right? One hydrogen atom plus two oxygen makes water. Jakarta traffic is horrible. It's hard to get to IES before car-free day is over. It's a fact. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. To the man who was crucified by those who thought they have all the authority. The word authority, it's exousia. It literally means out of the being, out of the substance of who he is. After Jesus spoke his sermon on the mount, the crowds were moved because he spoke with authority. He spoke with exousia. He spoke with out of being. Jesus' challenging words resonated with the really, really real, describing what reality is. This is why, by the way, when anyone encounters Jesus, they speak of coming home. I met so many people who came from another faith, and they encounter Jesus in dreams and vision, and they speak of coming home. No one who meets Jesus speaks of meeting a stranger. And because they feel like they're coming home, they would leave everything behind, including family members, rejection from them, abuse from them. Why? Because he is reality itself, or I should, sh- I should say, he is reality himself. When we surrender to him, we are surrendering to life himself. Exousia, the really real. All authority is given to me. Well, of course. And it is a very different kind of authority, a very different kind. If you remember throughout Jesus' earthly ministries, his disciples regularly fight for their positions in the kingdom of God that he was inaugurating. At one point, Jesus says to them, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not with you, he says. Not with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, the Son of Man mentioned in the book of Daniel, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for the ransom of many. Jesus exercises his authority in a very unexpected way, in the way of servanthood, in the way of giving his life for the life of the world. Washing his disciples' feet is not an exception to the way he lives with his disciples as Lord. Not at all. Washing his disciples' feet is not a contradiction of his authority. It's actually the manifestation of his authority. Being servant is what having authority is all about for Jesus. Think about that as we together embark on this Serve the City initiative. The president and CEO and sole proprietor of the universe exercises his authority to all by serving all. Imagine that. Let me say that again. The president and CEO and sole proprietor of the universe exercises his authority overall by serving all. And coming to terms with Jesus' great claim is what it means to follow him in the world. Think about that as we embark on this journey serving our city. And then finding ways to obey his great commission. The natural consequence, right? 
go and make disciples of all nations. Literally, it is go disciple the nations. Well, of course, given the great claim, the great commission is the natural consequence. And given the scope of the great claim, we understand the scope of the great commission. All authority, all nations. All authority, all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. I told you last week that I used to avoid preaching and hearing this text being preached. Usually the way it's preached goes something like this. Go and make disciples. Go. Go and make disciples. What part of go don't you understand? Go and make disciples. And then the guy would say that he did this and he did that and he did this and he did that. And I come out of that sermon feeling oppressed and depressed because I, can, I feel that I can never live up to what he's doing. But the gospel is liberating. It's not supposed to be oppressing. The word go here is not a command. It's not in the imperative form for you grammar geeks out there. It is a participle. Literally, it is in going, in your going. The assumption is that once we know who Jesus is, once we know his place in the universe, we will go. Once we have been gripped by the reality of his resurrection and ascension, we begin to move. We begin to go into action. In your going, Jesus says, what else are we going to do? In your going, what else are we going to do when we realize this new reality that he brought into being? In going. In your going. And the fact that it's a participle, Jesus says, in your going, to me, it's very very liberating. Why? Let me tell you why. Because it says, in going about your calling, in going about doing what I've called you to do in the spheres of life that I've put you in, disciple the nation. In going about as a businessman, disciple the nation. In going about as an artist, disciple the nation. In going about as a teacher, disciple the nation. In going about as a banker, disciple the nation. In going about as a lawyer, disciple the nation. In going about as a pastor, disciple the nation. All the nations. In going about comforting people, disciple the nation. In going about healing people, disciple the nation. In going about being a mentor to a person, disciple the people. In going about participating in Habitat for Humanity Built, Disciple the Nations. All nations. Liberating, right? It's Very liberating. It appreciates what God is calling you to do in every spheres of life. Because all authority in those spheres have been given to Jesus. All the nations. The word nation here is ethnoi, from which we get the word ethnic. All ethnic groups. Make disciples of all ethnic groups in the world. Jesus is saying that all the nations belong to me. All the nations belong to me. So help them. Help them live as mine. Help them live as I am their Lord. And that is why he's building his church in this building, in this corner of the city. And that is why he's building his church in any corner in any city. We exist to disciple people. Not just individuals, but whole people groups. Whole nations, bring all people groups into my great claim. Bring all the nations into this reality in which all authority has been given to me, to the man who lives by giving his life for the life of the world. And that's fulfilling God's call to Israel. God's first call to Israel through Abraham. He says, go and I will bless you and through you and all the fam- through you, all the families of the world will be blessed. The president and CEO and sole proprietor of the universe plans to bless the world by making disciples of all the nations. Disciples, not just converts, not just churchgoers, but disciples. Disciples who in turn make disciples, who in turn make disciples, who in turn make disciples, who in turn make disciples. disciples. Now, I know that the word disciple sometimes scare people, right? That word just, is just too intimidating. Some people would just say, I'm just a follower of Jesus. I'm not a disciple. Well, the word simply means a learner. A disciple is a learner, the one who learns. We're always in this learning posture at the feet of Jesus. Go make learners of the nations. 
go make learner making learners of all the nations. Isn't that exciting? Now, now what helps us, I think, if we realize that every human being is a disciple. Every human being is a disciple. A disciple of someone or something. That something could be a thought, ideology, philosophy, whatever it is. Every human being on the planet is a disciple of someone or something. And so the question is then never, can I be or will I be a disciple? The question is always, whose disciple will I be? Whose disciple will I be? Well, if not his disciple, then whose? Whose, right? Who else has exousia? Who else has authority? Who else speaks out of the very being? Who else lived by giving his life for the life of the world? Who else had conquered death? And so the question is never, can I or will I be a disciple? The question is always, whose disciple will I be? And what a great privilege Jesus is giving us. Come, he says, come and be my disciple. You know, in the first century, people would seek out a rabbi or a master who would guide them through life. People still do it today, right? And, and, and understandably so. And so people would go around their village or town and, and looking for someone and then apply to become that person's disciple. Jesus never waits for anyone to apply. Jesus goes around the villages and the towns and the cities and calls people into this great and wonderful adventure of being his disciple. That's why when Jesus came, to that, Jesus came that day to a group of fishermen, those guys immediately left their net when he said, follow me. That's because those fishermen know a good thing when they heard it. No one had ever came to them and invited them into discipleship, so they got up. They just got up and go. Jesus would later say to them, you did not choose me. I chose you. I chose you, Andrew. I chose you. I chose you, Tirza. I chose you. I chose you. I chose you. I chose you. And mercy, he chose me too. This broken guy, he chose me. You know, in the first century, being someone's disciple meant adopting the thinking of that master and imitating the behavior of that master. So come follow me means come adopt my thinking. Come imitate my behavior. What a privilege he is giving us. He to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given calls us to adopt his thinking, calls us to imitate his behavior. Come, and I will teach you to see the world the way I do. I'm going to teach you to think about God the way I think about God, to think about humanity the way I think about humanity, to think about history the way I think about history, to think about this city the way I think about the city. Come, he says, I will show you how to behave like a true human being. I want to behave like a true human being. What a privilege. Now, the fact is that Jesus goes beyond what first century master or rabbi had in mind. There are at least three other words that describe what Jesus had in mind in making disciples. They are, they are attachment, submission, and participation. Attachment. The, the rabbi of the first century would call people to the law or to Torah. And the, and the philosophers of the first century would call people to an ideology or a system of thought. Jesus calls people to himself. <laughs> Different, right? Jesus calls people to himself. The call is not to follow Torah. The call is not to follow an ideology. The call is follow me, be yoked to me, abide in me, eat of me, drink of me, live in me. Jesus attaches his disciples to himself. What a great privilege he's giving us. And then submission. Once attached to him, he then calls us to just do what he says. Earlier in the same gospel, the gospel of Matthew, he would say to his disciples, what do you call me, Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I tell you to do? Now, notice that Jesus refers to his teaching in a different way. He does not call his teaching principles to live by, although they are. He doesn't call his teaching doctrine to master, although it is. He doesn't call his teaching philosophy to contemplate, although it is. He, is, he calls his teaching commands. 
commands. All I have commanded you. Being Jesus' disciple means obeying his commands, submitting our will in ever deeper way to his claim upon our lives. That's what it means. And the wonderful thing is Jesus' commands are not burdensome. They are not burdensome. They're not heavy. Why? Because Jesus' commands comes out of authority, comes out of the very being. It comes out of his substance, out of the way life was supposed to be lived. When we hear his commands, we are being led into life as life is supposed to be. When we surrender to his commands, it turns out that we are surrendering to life himself. Attachment, submission, and the last one is participation. Not just following Jesus, not just imitating Jesus, but participate in Jesus. Participate in his life, which also turns out to be the life in the Father and the life in the Spirit. He calls us to participate in his life in the Father and in his life with the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. That's why on the mountain he says, go baptize them. Go baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As you know, baptized, to be baptized is, is more than just getting wet. To be baptized means entering into the reality signified by going into the water. The incredible privilege of being a disciple of Jesus is entering into the very life of the triune God. Let me say that again so it can sink into your heart. The incredible privilege of being a disciple of Jesus is entering into the very life of the triune God. When we are baptized into water, it's a sign that we have been baptized into the name. Whatever it is, the method, the fact remains is that in baptism, we are immersed into the name. Immerse into God as Father and Holy Spirit. To be baptized in water is to be immersed into the life and, and love of God the Father. And to be immersed into the grace and truth of God the Son. And to be immersed into the purity and power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls us to participate in the life of the Trinity. Whose disciple, let me ask you again, whose disciple would you rather be? To participate in and to, to, to participate in the work of the Trinity in the world. That is our goal with this Serve the City campaign. To participate in the work of the triune God that has already been happening in the city. To join the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in their wonderfully creative work in this city and the world in all spheres of life. We are creative because we are creatures made in the image of the Creator. Everyone in our city is a disciple of someone or something. And so in your going, disciple the nations, he said. Help the nations enter into the new reality where Jesus is president, CEO, and sole proprietor. Help them by baptizing them into the fullness of life in God, by teaching them to obey all that Jesus commanded. What a great privilege. And the great thing is, they did. Those 11 guys with a number of women, those who met Jesus on the mountain after his resurrection, left the mountain and then went back to the city, and they did. They did just what Jesus commanded them. And I can imagine them turning to one another saying, we, <laughs> we are going to disciple the nations of the world. Like, who does Jesus think we are? We are nobodies, right? We're hillbillies. We're from Galilee. We speak funny. But they did. They began serving. They began serving people that Jesus brings across their path. And, <laughs> and we are here because they did it. We are here because those 11 nobodies did it. That is what to be his followers is all about. Using our talents, our abilities, finding creative ways to obey his great commission. We are to ask all that we do here at IES. How does this help make disciples? We are to ask how does this help disciple the city and the nation. We have to always ask of all our programs, all our activities, how does this help us stay on task? How does this serve the city? Great claim, 
great commission, and great comfort. Being the church is all about learning to trust his great comfort. Surely I am with you always to the very end of age. What a great comfort. We, the church, we don't go into this great commission alone. The risen and ascended Jesus is there with us. Always, he says. Now, the question is how, right? How is he with us? How is he with us given the state of being in which Jesus now exists? How is it possible for him to be with all his disciples at all times? You see, when Jesus was risen, he's risen and alive in his body. And he also ascended in his body, a glorified body, yes, but still a physical body. He goes through doors and walls, but he still eats fish and bread. And so a physical body has limitations that the body implies. A human body, not a ghost. A glorified human body now, a human being now, sits on the throne of the universe. Yes, Jesus has always been fully human and fully God, but he sits at the throne of the universe in a human body. In a human body. Why? Because the incarnation never stops. The God taking on flesh goes on forever. God in Jesus became a human being, not just for 33 years that he was here on earth, God became a human being forever. God, the Son, became a human being forever. That's how God loved the world so much. That's how much the Creator loves His creation. God the Father sent God the Son to become one of us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it says the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, to be one of us forever. Again, remember, he's risen in a body, and he ascended in a human body, not in some kind of phantom ghostly existence. He ascended in his flesh and blood that he had on Easter morning. Let me put put it in a more startling way for you. When God the Father now sees God the Son, he sees a human face. Imagine that. He sees a human face, a face he had not seen before the Incarnation. When God, hear, when God the Father hears God the Son, he hears a human voice. When Jesus intercedes for us, God the Father hears a human voice. What was never in heaven before, human flesh, is in the ascended Jesus. He came to earth to become one of us, and he ascended to heaven as one of us. And because he existed, and he, he exists in a body, he can't just be everywhere, right? We can't be at two places at the same time. Now, how can then he be with us as he promised? How can he be with us here, believers in Jakarta or Johannesburg or Surabaya or Singapore or Melbourne or Moscow or New Delhi or New York? How can he be with all other believers in all other cities all at the same time? How can he fulfill his promise of great comfort I am there with you always. You can see then why his first disciples long for his return. If we read the New Testament, they will always end their worship service with Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. They realize they cannot know Jesus fully in his humanity until he comes back. Now, why did I emphasize all that? Why did I bring it up? To give you a theology lesson? No, although it's necessary, right? Good theology is always necessary. But I emphasize all that because the more we realize, listen carefully, the more we realize that he is ascended in his humanity, the more we will be awakened with this passionate longing for him to return. Come, Lord Jesus, so that we can see you face to face. Come, Lord Jesus, though, so that you can literally put your arms around me and heal my wounds and heal my brokenness. So let me ask you again, how can Jesus be with all of us everywhere all the same time? Now, as I read the New Testament, before he comes again, he is always with us in five ways. And the fifth one is the most important one. First, he's with us in the body, the church. 
Somehow we constitute his body in the world. Somehow we encounter Jesus in one another. Somehow we encounter the risen and ascended Jesus in the humanity of one another. That's why we need each other. There's so many one another verses in the New Testament. And that's why we also need to be in some kind of small group. Because somehow Jesus comes through to us in our one another's humanity. That's the first. The second, he's with us in the Lord's Supper. We at midweek celebrate the Lord's Supper every Tuesday. We do a, celebra- a weekly ce- a celebration of the Lord's Supper. Why? Because somehow the ascended Jesus meets us at the table. As we eat the bread and drink the cup, he is there with us. Somehow he comes. Not that the bread becomes flesh or the wine becomes blood. It's just that the physicality of the bread and the physicality of the wine reminds us of the physicality of the ascended Lord's flesh and blood. And somehow when we eat and drink as his body, he comes to us. He comes to us in the holy meal, in the church meal. The third way is, and this is directly to what we're launching today, he's with us in ministry. He's with us in ministry as we serve the least the last and the lost, we somehow encounter the man who is at the helm of the universe. Jesus says when we serve the least, the last, and the lost, we serve him. Not that the least, the last, and the lost are Jesus, not at all. It's just that somehow the ascended Jesus comes to us, and he comes to us, and he touches us, and we touch him as we serve and minister to others. That is why we simply have to be engaged in some sort of ministry. Ministry is not an option for being a disciple of Jesus. We cannot know him in his fullness. We cannot know him as ascended Lord unless we're involved in some kind of concrete service. The fourth way, the Bible. Jesus meets us in his word, in the Bible. Not that the, the Bible is some kind of magical word or book that falls out of the sky. No, not at all. That's what I've been preaching, te- uh, trying to teach my class in the New Testament Foundation and Old Testament Foundation this, this semester. The Bible is not a magical book. Not at all. It's just that he has chosen to meet us in the pages of that book. We cannot separate Jesus and his words. We only know him if he speaks. And when he speaks, somehow he comes and he's present. As we open and read, somehow what is described in the book emerges from the pages and the reality he's describing becomes three-dimensional. He meets us in his word. And so I cannot imagine being a disciple of Jesus apart from living in the word. If the only thing we do at the beginning of our day is turn on the TV, turn on the computer, look at our smartphones, they're okay to do. But if that's the only thing that we do, we are not going to realize. Let me say that again. We are not going to realize the true reality in which we are living. We need to live in the Word. So we see Jesus in the midst of everything. That's the reason why we have adult Bible classes. To provide as many opportunities as possible for for people, for you and I, to be living in the Word. And then the fifth and most important way, the way that makes all other ways work. He comes to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. He sends us His Spirit to live with us. He and God the Father sends God the Holy Spirit to live with us. And the Spirit, bless His name, the Spirit, the giver of life, somehow makes Jesus real to us. That's the Holy Spirit's number one job, to make Jesus real to us. The Spirit is not a substitute for Jesus. He is our link to Jesus. And because the Spirit is not flesh and blood, the Spirit is free, like the wind, free to blow everywhere it likes at all time, and therefore can make Jesus real at all time. That is the great comfort. If Misha can prepare, we're going to close with a song. That is the great comfort. And now you see why the New Testament speaks so much about the Holy Spirit. We sang about the Holy Spirit. I love that song. 
because it is impossible to follow Jesus in this city apart from the Holy Spirit. You see, the whole Christian life is life in and with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit links us to the ascended Lord. And so that even if the ascended Lord is limited in his glorified humanity, he can be made real to us. And learning to live in that great comfort is what following Jesus is all about. As we follow him to serve the city, remember this, to follow him means... To come to, great, to, to, to come to terms with His great claim. It means to always find ways to obey His great commission. And it means to never stop learning to trust in His great com- 